Welcome to Plant Based Profits. I'm Ronnie Tsunami Gandiza with my co host, Sean Stratton. In today's show, we have with us Steve Demos. Steve is a natural foods trailblazer and visionary, a progressive entrepreneur with 35 years' experience in creating and marketing environmentally and socially conscious foods. Steve is co founder and former CEO of White Wave Inc., the silk brand, and the co founder of Next Foods and its Good Belly brand of probiotic juice. All right, Steve Jamos, thank you so much for taking some time to speak with us today. It's great to have you here. Pleasure, Sean and Ronnie. I really appreciate being here. Thanks for the invite. Yeah, I hear some birds in the background. Maybe you can tell us a little about where you're uh, where you're talking to us today. I live uh, part time in Costa Rica. Um, what you're probably hearing is either parrots or toucans. Um, I like to call it living in the midst of a zoo. Um, <laughs> a lot of mammals, a lot of birds. <laughs> very, very uh, uh, flourishing area. Yeah, what part of Costa Rica? Uh, down south in a town called Dominical. I'm near the Osa Peninsula, which has one mm. third of the biodiversity on the planet. So anywhere from insects to all the wildlife that I just described, um, there's everything, including a lot of foliage. So it's, wow. uh, it's a paradise. We're south of where all the tourism is. Um, so it's very remote. You've got a lot of experience, of course, over the years and have traveled the world. Why did you choose Costa Rica to have at least part time of the year as your residence? Fair question. Um, I had been traveling, and I'm sure we'll get into it. I had been traveling around the world uh, for a while, kind of like a satellite spinning around the globe. And I was looking for a, um, a retreat home some place that I could go during the winter time. Colorado is where my home base is. And I had been looking in the South Pacific. I had been looking in a number of different places and I was invited to come down to Costa Rica. Well, I found that I could go uh, leave at breakfast time and be here at dinner. I found that the country was extraordinarily beautiful and that the people live by a concept they call Pura Vida, Pura Vida which is pure life. And they are very happy. Um, they truly are with not having a lot. And a, a, a very significant percentage of their country is devoted to uh, eco reserve. So they have no standing army since 1949, something like that. Mm -hmm. They're eco reserve, they're friendly. Um, they are uh, close to home and they're very compatible with Americans. So I chose it on the basis of falling in love with the country, the people, the culture, the climate, the whole works. Awesome. Yeah, it's beautiful. I was down there in that area actually uh, a few years ago uh, and my wife took some mat leave and uh, we really enjoyed our time. Um, I want to yeah. start back just uh, learn more about your childhood before you got fully into your, your business career and, and your travels and Tell, tell us a little about your, your, your growing up experience, where you grew up, uh, what it was like, what, what were your interests, your highlights? I grew up outside of Philadelphia, uh, around Villanova University, um, Haverford, Wayne, Pennsylvania. I was uh, living in suburbia, and my father was a, uh, an entrepreneur, uh, a very honest and uh, of high integrity capitalist who... Um, didn't philosophically teach me, but by example, he taught me that business with integrity was um, of great value. Um, he was surrounded by people who loved to work for him and ended up with a fairly sizable company, a couple of factories. So that was my influence. What type, um, of, what type of businesses were they? He was in the uh, metals business, um, okay. well drawn fluxes and... Um, uh, ultimately, um, platinum for uh, long life uh, batteries and a few other things like that. So he, he his factories were um, a processing for uh, more refined industries. That's basically what he did. Um, 
you know, you could think of him as a traveling salesman if he came, before he became an entrepreneur. So I was raised, uh, I'm one of five children, and was raised in a uh, suburban American household um, in the 50s and 60s. Uh, the 60s had a very big influence on me. I went away to college um, out in uh, Bowling Green, Ohio. And it was during the time of the Vietnam War draft. And I remember sitting in a room when they picked the first lottery number. Wow. And I think that was, if I remember correctly, September 15th or something like that. And I breathed a big sigh of relief and walked out of the room. And then somebody said, you better come back here. And I came back because I was number two. And this is 1969. And the draft was initiated for 1970. And I was graduating from college in 1970 as number two of the draft. Um, wow. I had resigned myself that I was going to Canada, but I showed up for the exam and tried to flunk the intellectual um, questionnaire. And, you know, the questions were so simple that uh, is red a color, um, what direction is up? And I passed that part. So I have a congenital heart murmur. Um, it basically is a, um, oh, if you will, uh, uh, it, it was a leaky valve. They haven't found it in years and years. They hadn't found it for years and years. But I used to have to get a note from my doctor to participate in sports. I was a high school wrestler. And standing in line for the draft physical, they said anybody with, and they rambled off about 18 different things, and they said the word heart murmur, step forward. So I stepped forward and, you know, sure enough, they're going down with the stethoscope, going past people one by one by one, just moving along. I was in the line and everything was fine. And they got to me and they checked it and they came back and checked it twice. Then they looked at me and said, you need to come with us. So I went in a room and they said, do some jumping jacks. Did some jumping jacks, did some push-ups, took my heart again and they looked me in the eyes and they said you're not fit for this man's army you can go home and wow. I, I I am a product of the 60s and I've taken a couple of things that you, you call getting high <laughs> and I have never been higher than the moment that I got the freedom of my life <laughs> by being, being float from my draft physical so I went back to college I graduated and I was in in India six months later Wow. As, as a child growing up, did you um, have an entrepreneurial spirit? Were you, were you selling? Did you have the lemonade stand? Were you, did you see yourself kind of going down that road? It's in the DNA. Yeah. Yes, I did. Uh, we, I think at one point we were digging up shrubbery out of the forest and selling it to the neighbors. <laughs> at another time, we were searching for golf balls on the edge of the um, the local golf course and selling them back to the golfers. So yeah, I have, um, capitalism was in my spirit uh, and my DNA. The problem was that during the era that when I graduated from college, capitalism was the pariah of society. It was evil, big, greedy, exploiting the environment, exploiting the people that touched it. I hate to say it, but it's an awful lot like capitalism is today. And so I um, always have had a, a great fondness and intrigue with mysticism and used to go down to the University of Pennsylvania Museum and hang out in the displays for uh, some of the Hindu displays, the Buddhist displays, the Egyptian displays. And I was always fascinated by this. Um, so when I had flunked my draft physical, I decided that I was going to go away. Um, like as in permanently, because I couldn't justify the capitalist drive in mm. me, given the peer group uh, uh, view of the lack of value in capitalism. And it's kind of like your DNA has just been rejected. Right. And I said, great, I'll go live um, with the mystics. I had read a book called The Autobiography of a Yogi. I don't know if you've ever heard of this, but a book by uh, Piramahansa Yogananda. And um, it's quite a fascinating read about a guru who came out of India in the 30s. And I said, if this stuff exists on the planet, I'm going to go find it. 
Hmm. And I and my partner at the time, who ultimately became a lifelong friend and my partner at White Wave, um, flew to Europe. And then we hitchhiked on the tops of trucks across the Mideast down into uh, India. Wow. And that's where you stayed for a while, <laughs> I understand. On and off for the next four years. Um, I mean, honestly, the, the, the first uh, part of it was more about the adventure of crossing through Turkey, Iran, Afghanistan, Pakistan, and all the things that go along with that. Um, that was the, uh, the hippie dream of the day, right. was to roam around Afghanistan. Um, went down into India, and then um, I used to call it, we went on the Guru Trail. We, before uh, a lot of the people who became famous as gurus in the United States left India, um, we had the great privilege of being able to meet these people at home, at their homes, right. uh, with very few people surrounding them. This was 1971. And so from 71 through 74, we stayed on and off in India. We would come back and either work for a couple months or sell everything that we owned. And then we would do it again. We'd go fly to Europe and then hitchhike across the, uh, the Mideast on the tops of the trucks and uh, go back down into India and stay longer and longer. Um, ultimately, it, it, it became, uh, we bought one-way tickets. And we had no intention of, uh, of coming back for a very long time. Wow. What was it like at that time for you, knowing that Vietnam War was going on? Obviously, you got the medical exemption. Were you, you know, just checked out and not following it at all? Were you feeling any bit of guilt? Did you have friends that went over? I had classmates from high school that went over and never came back. Uh -huh. I was totally... I mean, I, I bought into the mantra, turn on, tune in, drop out. And mm -hmm. I had dropped out. I mean, I had, this was pre any form of technological communication. I mean, we had onion skin uh, aerograms that took a month to go back and forth in the postal system. So the only communication I had was if somebody sent me something post restant Kabul, Afghanistan, I would pick it up and have a communication from home. Wow. But the, the reality was totally dropped out. Had no idea. I, I, I was against uh, the war. I had participated in the anti-war movement mm -hmm. in the 60s, but I was not in a position where there was anything that I could do about it effectively. So I became involved with Vipassana. And mm -hmm. Vipassana was taught by a man by the name of S.N. Goenka who was a, a Burmese businessman turned uh, Buddhist meditation teacher through a series of events. Um, his, he's known today as the man who taught the world how to meditate. Vipassana is a, um, the introduced to the Vipassana takes a 10 day intensive course of um, maybe 12 to 14 hours a day of meditation. And it revolutionized uh, me out of being a, a vagabond hippie into uh, I was a very serious uh, yogi and meditator uh, going on for quite a while. Um, we ended up on the far bank of the Rishikesh River, which is the spawning ground of the gurus in uh, Upper Ganges in India, right. living in a cave. Wow. And um, we were studying, we were, if you will, wannabe sadhus or renunciates. We barely had, we had sold everything that we owned. We had run out of money. So we were living off of very little um, and living in the forest and practicing uh, a lot of yoga, a lot of meditation and foraging for firewood uh, to cook our dal and chapatis in the evening. And I was studying Buddhist scripture at the time and came across um, a reference in the Eightfold Noble Path to the concept of right livelihood. Hmm. Yeah, and that. 
it was like a lightning bolt or an epiphany to me that it became the justification for um, capitalism because the principle behind right livelihood is that you inject personal moral beliefs into business and that becomes the guiding principle, not the product, not the uh, marketplace. The guiding principle is, is your product and your intent wholesome and helpful? Is it solving your problem? And is it morally sustainable? Which means it does no harm, no harm to you, no harm to the consumer, no harm to the planet, no harm to animals, no harm to anything. It is a golden rule, it's idealistic, but it, um, it influenced me so deeply that after the on and off four year period of being in India, I told Pat, Pat Calhoun, my partner, I said, we're leaving and I'm going back to the United States to prove that there is a higher order of capitalism that exists and I'm going to prove it to myself by starting a company. I had no mm -hmm. idea what the company was going to be. And prove that right livelihood was the justification of capitalism. Um, remember, this is self-serving because I had denied my own self-interest this whole time. So we hitchhiked back across uh, Asia and into Europe. Um, and uh, ended up back in the United States in 1974 uh, with no idea what we were going to do, how we were going to do it. But um, our travels had ended, and now I had purpose and mission. Wow. With, with the right livelihood concept, what did your family think of it or friends? Did you tell anybody else when you discovered this concept and tried to bridge you know, your mysticism, if you will? Sure with uh, your capitalism uh, side of it, what did they say? Um, if you were to ask my father where I was, he'd say he's up a tree somewhere in India. So I wasn't taking all that seriously. <laughs> uh, it was, you're idealistic, um, you're, 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 what you say is truthful, it's honorable, but it's not practical in this world. And I didn't listen to any of it. I, I, I was totally committed. I, I was on a mission of deep purpose and there was nothing that was going to deter me from that. And for the longest period of time, even when I decided to do what I've done and we'll talk about that, I was told that you're wasting your life and you will never be able to verify these kind of this kind of idealism. So, you know, the message in that is uh, shoot higher, don't leave home. <laughs> so, so tell us about how you, I understand you, you, your business started off in, in, in the tofu space. How did you get from coming back from India to, to starting a, a tofu business? Um, we had become uh, effectively vegan although we ate a little bit of yogurt, if I remember, that was it. When we had been in India for years and years, uh, so we were already mm -hmm. uh, veg, vegan, by the time we got back to the United States. And we joined a yoga group and moved up to uh, the southern part of New Hampshire on the Massachusetts border. And I've always had a passion for food. I've been uh, baking since I was a kid. And um, I just find it to be, without sounding overly um, spiritual about it, it's sacred. It's, um, it's where we get all of our spirit and our energy from. So I would go down to uh, Boston, to Chinatown, with a couple other people and uh, buy the food for this vegetarian ashram, if you will, group of people. Right. And on the way back, uh, I would eat all the tofu in the back seat <laughs> because I just fell in love with this raw, funny food. And I would obviously upset everybody at the yoga group. 
So they said, you know, what are you going to do about this? And I said, well, I'll learn how to make tofu and I'll supply you with it. So I got a hold of 10 Talents cookbook, which has a recipe in the back of it for making bean curd tofu. Mm. And I made tofu for this group. Well, I decided that at the same time I was studying Tai Chi Chuan and there was going to be a seminar in Boulder, Colorado of Tai Chi teachers. Hmm. So I decided that I would leave the group and I hitchhiked out to Boulder and then just continued and went down into Santa Barbara where I did a 76 day Vipassana course. Wow. And during this course, um, after enough meditation, you don't sleep. There's no need for it. Um, mm. And I would be awakened at one o'clock in the morning and saying, do I really want to go to the meditation hall and start this early? So I went to the, the leaders of the camp and I said, I know how to make tofu. Would you like me to make tofu for you? If you get me the beans and the nagari, the coagulant, uh, I'll make tofu for the camp. I mean, there was 200 people that were, uh, that were attending these courses, uh, these back-to-back -back courses that I was attending. So I began making tofu on a larger scale for this course. And um, when I was supposed to be sitting on the pillow, I came up with a business idea. I came up with the logo. I came up with the name. I came up with the product list. And upon completion of the course, I went back to uh, Boulder, Colorado, borrowed $500 and began um, making tofu at home and selling it to my Tai Chi class. And thus, White Wave began. Wow. Where did you get the name White Wave? Where, what was that significance? The, <laughs> I made it up. The curds, um, when you curdle it, looks like the foam of the ocean. Um, and I was stirring the pot literally one morning and it dawned on me, this is what it reminds me of, was a white wave, a cresting wave. So I then remembered the, uh, I think his name was Hokusai, the Hokusai print of the great wave from the 1600s and said, that's basically, if I was in the spaghetti business, it would be Mona Lisa spaghetti. Hmm. Um, so, you know, borrowing the Hokusai uh, image of the cresting wave, I came up with the name and the logo and uh, went forward from there. Fantastic. With um, starting out with tofu in Boulder, um, tell us a little bit about just kind of starting up that, that part of the business or your, your first real business, I guess. Um, you know, what were the early years like? Hell. Um, <laughs> well, Short answer. <laughs> I started off as an artisan tofu maker. Right. I wanted to make uh, a genuine, authentic artisan tofu. So I had wooden presses and a hand lever um, uh, separation device and a, an iron cauldron and uh, a blender. And I would make tofu in the back room. And while Small is uh, artisan and extraordinarily beautiful, um, Pat and I were both um, with partners and needed to make a living and we weren't making a living at the, uh, making tofu. Right. So we started the business in 1977, and by 1979, the early part of 1979, we realized that the only way this was going to work is make it into a bigger uh, factory, if you will. So we moved the tofu making part of the business to uh, a converted warehouse where we bought much larger equipment and in, uh, installed it and began making large batch tofu. We kept the store, renamed that the Cow of China, and it became a vegan delicatessen in 1979. 
Wow. So we had an outlet to sell our product and experiment with other um, products. Our goal, our mission from day one was through the principles of right livelihood, we will fully integrate the use of natural soy into the average American diet. And tofu was so esoteric, mm -hmm. so far, that nobody had any idea what to do with it. And it's an ingredient like uh, wheat flour. You make things out of it. So we began making cheeseless pizza and mock tuna and what we called missing egg salad. We made soy milk. We made almond milk. We made a lot of the things, anything we could possibly think of to, to introduce uh, the American market to soy. The goal here was to get people to eat lower on the food chain mm -hmm. because the observation was that the use of animal product was not sustainable. It was, we were a rising tide of humanity inhabiting the planet and the use of grains for feed for animals is horrendously inefficient. This was known then. So the intent right. was yeah. to make more protein available for human, the humans that were coming along. Right. And to do that, we'd have to give them an entry point of uh, what their diet was going to be like. So mm -hmm. um, thus the choice in soy. I and, understand and, that early on you were, you were having some friends help you with the sales of your tofu. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Well, I suppose you're referring to the little red wagon. Yeah, or yeah, I think that's what, what, when you had uh, some employees um, helping purchase. Yeah. Oh, 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 no. Okay. Yes. So we moved into the factory, and um, the, the supermarket chain in, the leading supermarket chain in Colorado was King Supers, and its competitor, Safeway and Albertsons. And we were manufacturing, now we're manufacturing, you know, 100 pounds an hour or something like that, and we might have had six employees. And we wanted to get distribution outside of uh, just the health food stores, the natural food stores. So I went down to the buyer at King Supers with tofu in a plastic bag with a twist tie around it and said, I want to sell you this product. He almost fell off his chair laughing at me. He said, I think you need a package. So <laughs> that's how naive I was at the time. Right. So I said, okay, I'll be back. And about... Oh, a couple of months later, I came back and I had tofu in a plastic bag to put into a Chinese carryout carton with a white wave label on the top of it. And he said, fabulous, I'm going to give you a, a try at this. So he gave us two stores in Boulder, um, two King's Super stores. And I went back to the employees that we had, including myself and my partner, and I said, I want you to, here's money. I want you every day to go out and buy a block of tofu from one of these two stores every day. And we did. Wow. For the next month, we bought our own product off the shelf every day. So I went back in for my review meeting and he said, wow, these numbers look great. We're going to give you the whole chain. This was 50 some stores. Whoa, that's a big chain. And there was no entry fee. There was no cost to get it. All we had to do was deliver the product to the distribution warehouse, and we were now a bona fide manufacturer of mainstream available tofu. Shortly thereafter, Safeway called, Albertsons called, the independent uh, grocers called, and we began manufacturing what the LA Times ca called the most hated food in the United States. <laughs> wow. <laughs> That, that's not a great well, uh, entry level and en entry into the market having uh, that that article come out. No, I used to say hate me harder. Uh, it, it it any PR is good PR because it sticks in the mind. So tofu became the curse, if you will, but everybody knew what it was, right. and you either loved it or you hated it, but you had an opinion about it. You knew about it. Hmm. That accomplished more than a small company can ever dream of accomplishing. 
in the introduction of something new. So our challenge was to change that bias. And we worked for the next 18 years. That's why I said it was hell. For the next 18 years, we did demos, we invented tofu products, we invented baked tofu, tofu dressings. We made everything that we could possibly think of out of tofu and sold it into the supermarkets and the, um, uh, the natural foods industry. So for 18 years, we generated a business that was about $10 million to $12 million at that point. Um, it was profitable. Um, it paid our mortgages. We could raise a family. And I genuinely believed that I was working for my grandkids because I thought and still do that um, soy is a, a noble contribution to the health of humanity. And if you question whether it's safe or not, I would just ask you to look at China for 2,500 years, for Japan 2,000 years, they've eaten naturally processed soy without negative health effects. Mm -hmm. So we didn't need to do any studies. I, I chuckle when I hear people say it's dangerous. Um, it's, a, it's one of the most basic foods, and it is eating lower on the food chain. So we were very proud of the fact that we were enticing people to move down the food chain. Mm -hmm. Now, there were about, about maybe 270 companies or so at the same time that were breaking into tofu. What separated you from those companies? Why did you outlast, or how did you outlast those companies? Ronnie, you did your homework. <laughs> You're we try. We try. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Um, you're absolutely right. Um, we were persevering. Re remember, it wasn't tofu. It wasn't soy that I was out to prove. I was out to prove right livelihood. I was out to demonstrate a higher order of capitalism. I, that, that's the reason that I'm speaking with you today, because I have the opportunity to speak about something that I, is, I believe is of a higher moral order, the most, uh, one of the most powerful forces on the planet is capitalism. And can you imagine a society and a world that centered around morally driven business, where the products and the services were wholesome, the intent was to help and solve problems, not to exploit, and no violence, no exploitation, no anything along those lines was present in the value chain. So I, I, it wasn't a question of whether soy would succeed or not. It was a question of what product would make it succeed, and I was relentless in trying this. So, you know... I was told by a, a, an investor once, if they gave out an award for perseverance, you'd be the gold champion. Um, I, I, it, it, I believed in our mission, and my product was second. And that is what made us unstoppable. Failure was not an option. It was just not going to occur. What was your, what was your family like at, life at this time, kind of those, those formidable years with the tofu business? Did you have kids? My personal family life. Yeah, did you have older. kids? What were some of the stresses? I, had, yeah. I, I have two children. I, mm -hmm. I had children probably um, two years after I began the business. I had my son, and then my daughter was born three years later. Um, so I was a, a householder. Mm -hmm. um, my wife was at the time was an artisan and making um, arts and crafts for a, a co-op. And I was uh, the entrepreneur, and I was just living a, um, you know, the average American life with uh, the American dream in mind of starting off on your own, coming up with an unknown idea and product, and succeeding at it. And again, you know, I, I, I the difference for me was I had a passion that I never stopped talking about. I'm sure I was a real bore at parties. Uh, because it was it was my reason for being and it gave me great great value to be able to demonstrate this so my goal was I will prove 
that virtue can out-profit the profiteers. I wanted to change Wall Street. Right. Wow. And were the kids involved in the business at all or, or your wife? Well, on weekends, my wife would work at the co-op. So I worked every day and I would take the kids with me to the factory. And we worked uh, six days a week and seventh day was maintenance. But I would do food experiments and R&D experiments. We had no R&D department. Uh, I was basically uh, anywhere from bottle washer up to uh, chief crazy. Uh, so I would take them with me and they didn't, they, my son ultimately did work in the factory 18 years later as a oh, wow. supervisor on one of the production shifts, but, um, they were, I, I apologized to them once in public, um, when I was getting an award for all of the bad food experiments that I, that I fed them during those times <laughs> they went to the factory with and the therapy that probably requires. Right. Now, with all of your employees, as you said, you're going to the factory, you were doing stuff with your family, you have a, a mission, right? A higher mission, if you will, you know, based on virtue and wanting to essentially change the world. When you brought in employees, did that impact also who you selected as an employee? Did they have to be vegan or vegetarian or what was your criteria or did you have any criteria that was maybe different from your typical business owner my criteria was my intuition of the person and i ran them always um pat calhoun and i were partners uh, she did the financial work and i did everything else i would never hire anybody unless i walked them through her office and her intuition was so strong she could tell within the first 10 seconds of meeting somebody, whether it was a fit or not, we did have a criteria. Um, would this pe would would this person be open-minded and meet the integrity level that we were assigning to this business? I mean, I, I I had regular company meetings all the way back to the very very beginning, and I would always open the meeting with the mission statement and the principles of right livelihood and why we were doing what we were doing. I mean, anybody that had a history in White Wave will probably um, remember, I'm sure remembers, that the frequency of, these, frequency of these was monthly in the beginning and then quarterly as we became a larger and larger company. But um, it was, uh, you asked earlier, what's the differentiating factor that sustained us? This mission is the differentiating factor that sustained us. You mentioned that you had tried soy milk um, early on. Where, you know, what happened to that experiment and, and, you know, what was different when you obviously went on a bigger scale with soy milk? We'll differentiate between um, extracted bean juice and soy milk. And I don't mean that disparagingly, but there's a difference. When you make tofu, you first have to make soy milk. And the soy milk, the bean juice, is made by um, grinding up the beans with water and then boiling them to neutralize the trypsin inhibitor. Um, that trypsin inhibitor that is being neutralized, if it's slow cooked, gives off a beany flavor. And that flavor is what um, you would taste in a milk made out of really low-tech uh, soy milk. So we made, you know, at the time, chocolate was out of food. We made carob, we made vanilla, we made a number of different soy milks. Uh, we made almond milk. We made a number of things that um, we were trying to promote vegan uh, foods at the same time to determine what would work. Uh, in the, around 1990, maybe the late 80s, I identified an opportunity in the soy milk business to, um, to penetrate the market with a new concept. Now, up until that point, soy milk was primarily being imported from Japan, where they had developed a process 
of neutralizing this enzyme trypsin, um, which affects the digestive system. That's why no raw animal will eat soy, no human will eat soy in its raw form. It has to be cooked or you'll have digestive issues. So the, um, the soy milk coming across from Japan, uh, the market was so small that it had to be packaged in long shelf life aseptic packaging. And there's brick packs that you see soup is in, juice is in, soy mm -hmm. milks are in, almond milks are in, out on the dry shelf. That made them about as far in as you could possibly get. And the only market that was available for these products was the macrobiotic market. And the formulations were strictly for the macrobiotics. It was barley malt foreign flavors and it appeared to me that the market for soy was growing we were doing fine as a tofu company we had at that point for many years back had launched tempeh uh, we had launched seitan so we were in the meat replacement uh, uh, plant-based protein as it's called today alternative business and i saw the beverage market um, as an entry point uh, for uh, one big reason. And that is, remember we were talking about our big challenge was, well, what do you do with tofu? How do you teach somebody what to do with it? Right. So the insight was that if you put something in a glass and it's um, ivory colored, white colored, you're going to know what to do with it. So your choice is, do I like this? Do I not like this? Do I want this? Do I not want this? But there's no educational burden. Right. There, so you've taken away a huge aspect of the marketing associated with introducing a foreign substance to the consumer's mind. We are leveraging familiarity. Right. And, right. and, and that became the insight. Well, then I looked into how to make this uh, non-flavored, a uh, non-beanie flavored soy milk and found that it would cost about $8 million a factory. Wow. Well, we were only doing 10 million to begin with. So that was kind of out of the question at the time until um, the early 90s when the U.S. government decided that they would do uh, small business loans to companies that could verify they were going to create employment and they would um, loan at 1% above money. Wow. So Pat and I leveraged our homes and we borrowed uh, the money to start a factory uh, after having some contract manufacturers make it for us um, and we built a factory. It must have took and a huge amount of confidence to, to make that leap after all those years. Well, I, I, I jumped ahead of myself a little bit. We actually introduced the product, came up with the name. I, I actually paid somebody for the name but um, and then rejected it. Oh, yeah. And then slept on that for the weekend and came to my senses. Um, and we had um, leveraged uh, making the product at another factory and introduced this product called Silk in 96. Um, Silk uh, was well received primarily because of what I described a minute ago, combined with the fact that it was, it was formulated as a a replacement for dairy milk, not for the macrobiotic community. So we had no problem using organic beans, organic sugar, um, and keeping it as simple as possible, or making chocolate silk, uh, unheard of at the time, in chocolate soy milk. So we put it in a milk carton, which was revolutionary for the time, and mm -hmm. introduced it and launched it as a refrigerated product. Um, to do this, we had to go into factories that were requiring truckload quantities of 
product to be sold and we hadn't even launched the product. So I did a whirlwind tour of the natural products distribution industry in the United States and told everybody that I was going to do the most bodacious launch of a product in natural products history. And they said, well, demonstrate that for us. Mm -hmm. So I, I, was, I was at a conference table with all of these buyers up in New England. There was about 10 people sitting around the table. And I said, fine. And I took off my shoes and I stood on top of their table. Oh, I said, the rest of the presentation, walking back and forth on the conference table. Wow. And they said, your only problem is going to be if you can keep up. And I said, don't you worry about us keeping up. Wow. We That's amazing. So I climbed down on the table and got the sale. Wow. Oh, I was, I was fanatical. Yeah, I that's incredible. I, I'm personally interested in, I haven't figured out what's the, you know, so you, you decide to put it in a milk card and, and, and fr refrigerate it. Is the formula different in a refrigerated soy milk as the one that's carton on the shelf, the dry shelf? And was it more of a marketing thing to go in the fridge or was it that's the, what had to happen for, for the product? Uh, I don't think there's any difference in the formulations of shelf stable aseptic product and the current product silk out on the market. I think that we basically turned the market towards these formulations so that our goal was first to leverage familiarity. So we made chocolate silk and we handed it out in at the exit to stores because we already knew if I said soy, you'd say yuck. So we knew that dem demoing a product in the store was a waste of our time. So we gave out milk cartons like you used to get in elementary school mm. of chocolate silk on the exit to the stores, along with a brochure and information on soy and a coupon. And we leveraged the familiarity. And that's what the marketing really was, is we mm. were leveraging the familiarity. By putting a refrigerated product out, we were um, targeting being put next to milk because, well, that's where the refrigerated section is and that's the type of product and it's in a milk cart. So we were first. We were fortunate to be set up um, directly with the milk competition and we stated clearly on the outside of the product what it was used for by the image of a bowl of cereal and a, a pouring of, a, of milk over the top of it because my experience was that soy milk tasted like the bottom of a bottom of um, cereal when you were a kid. Mm -hmm. So if I introduced you to something that you're already familiar with, your, ta your flavor resistance was going to be neutralized. And sure enough, your only decision had to be, do I dairy or do I not? And everything else was um, self-explanatory. What was the reaction of the medical community? Because obviously, especially at that time, milk was such a, uh, a big marketing engine, right? Dairy industry. Well, what was the reaction when you first launched not just when he first launched it, but when it really started to pick up steam, what was some of the pushback or what did you have to dispel in terms of myths or any kind of messaging put out by the dairy industry? Well, um, first of all, the use of the word milk was challenged by FDA um, because it is a protected word. And <clears throat> As a protected word, it has a standard of identity, but it, it had never been enforced. And they came, the dairy industry came after us with um, that. And uh, you're, you're misusing a standard of identity. FDA did not enforce it. Um, FDA let it ride. And we basically fired back, well, you've got coconut milk. What's the problem with that? You've got milk and magnesia. What's the problem with that? So you don't really have a basis unless you go after everybody out there um, that's doing this. But even of more importance was that two years before announcement, 
the FDA contacted the natural soy industry, not the high tech soy, the natural soy, the low technology, the soy extracted by water, and said, we're going to do a, 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 a heart health claim. And we, uh, we will authorize, we will approve that soy is beneficial for the reduction of cholesterol. And that was a motivation for us that I said to my team, look, we've been doing this for 18 years. And the FDA is now about to tell the world to go consume soy. We are either going to hand it to a large company or we are going to go like a, uh, a bat out of hell and get our placement of this product in the marketplace. And thus we went out on what was later referred to as the Silk Parade, where we went to every major supermarket chain in the United States. And um, we told them what was going to happen with FDA. And uh, we wanted placement. And we would do in-store demos with it. We would support the product. But we were first mover. And they all supported it and said, yes, there'll be a demand. So once again, um, the media took care of all the advertising and the marketing. They basically mm -hmm. told the, pro the public, go eat soy, low technology soy, because it's going to reduce your cholesterol. So we, we knew that the media was going to do this. So we didn't have to do any advertising. And we went to NPR nationally and said, we want to sponsor one of your sponsors, your small sponsors, uh, all things considered. And uh, they said, well, you know, you can do that. Uh, what are you going to use for a tagline? And we said, we'll use three words. Silk is soy. Silk is soy. Hmm. And that's all we used. Brought to you by White Weight Incorporated, blah, 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 blah. Silk is soy. And the, 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 the marketing by the media attracted the attention of the consumer to uh, the supermarket looking for soy. And there we were with the brand name Silk, which was brilliant. Um, thank you, Dale Hess. Mm -hmm. And um, away we ran. Wow, that, that's incredible. At that time of that kind of enormous growth, what it, when it took off, were you, um, you had that loan from the government, were you now, uh, you know, looking for more investors? Were you just, you know, using, using the profits back in the company? Well, what was your financial state like? Because sometimes I know that can be a massive stress on, on businesses if they grow too fast. <laughs> we decided to take advantage of this FDA uh, announcement and the opportunity to put it on the shelf um, by going around to the dairies and to the large beverage companies of the United States, Coca-Cola, Pepsi-Cola, Dean Foods, um, any of the uh, large, large corporations and saying, you know, we've got a company that's going to take off like a rocket ship. You want to invest. Dean Foods Chicago said yes. We'll give you, and I think it was 10 or $15 million to enter the market. And um, we took it. We sold a third of the company for that amount of money. And um, what was ironic about it was that we never used a dime of it to enter the market because the marketplace never said they wanted any of um, the slotting allowance. They were going to let us on for free. In the process of taking this investment, we set a horizon on our company that we would um, sell the remaining uh, two thirds of the company at market fair market value, be determined by third parties in three years. Well, we were a $14 million company and we started doubling every year or more and ended up after those three years um, at well over a hundred million dollars. Wow, we, and then that, that sale up, didn't take place then, did it? The sale took place in 2002. Right. And it was after we had raised the money to um, place the product in the supermarkets. And mm -hmm. like I said, the, the irony was that um, we didn't even use it. Right. We never needed it. 
So I, I, I wanted to take the company public and my team said, look, 13, I mean, 18 years of brain damage. I don't think we want to go into the public market. <laughs> so I said, OK, I understand. We'll take the, the investment money and move from there. So we took Dean Foods money and um, we we then persevered on our own. We thought we would get distribution through Dean Foods. We did not. We thought we would get manufacturing through Dean Foods. We did not. Mm. We accomplished this as a team independently and ultimately built nine of those tofu fac I mean, those soy milk factories that I was talking about. With Dean Foods being the largest dairy company, right? Or at least the second largest dairy company uh, in the U.S., how did you merge that with your beliefs, obviously, as a vegan, vegetarian, socially conscious company? There are people now that will question whether, why you're partnering or using any type of company in any way, shape, or form uh, that has questionable practices, or at least practices that they believe are contrary to their, their principles. Did you have to deal with that within your own company? No, I didn't have to deal with it in my own company. Nobody really challenged it, but I think the question is extraordinarily legitimate. And um, the fact of the matter is, I, I, I can summarize it in one statement. When I was with the chairman of the company that ultimately owned uh, Silk called Squeeze the Foods, they bought Dean. Dean was the largest dairy in the world at the time we sold to them. And he, we were driving to the airport and he said to me this, this, and that about milk. And he said, what do you have about milk? And I said, I don't have anything against milk. I just have a better product than you got. So I honestly believed we were going to obsolete milk, that our, our job was to convert every factory and every pipe in the United States into uh, plant-based milk. And I was committed to do this. So I had no problem because I knew I was going to convince them I could make them more money. And I used to go into the dairies and say, I don't know what you charge to process a gallon of milk, but I'll pay you 10% more to process silk. And the dairy industry hadn't seen a price increase since they started. So for them to uh, find a, a, a product they could put through their factories, and increase their profits. We had we were batting a thousand. Everybody that we went to said that we would they would product produce our product. Remember, I said a minute ago that Dean Foods never produced any of our product, so they weren't going to compete against us, but they weren't going to help us. So I went to all the independent dairies and got them to make the product. Well, that meant there was no factories left for competition. We had two to three years where we were the exclusive supplier and manufacturer of soy milk in the United States, sitting in the refrigerated case alone with no competition. Wow, what a, what a dream for any, for any business. That's... It was serendipitous. It was serendipitous. I mean, obviously we used a, a, a bunch of skill and effort in doing so, but Absolutely. it was an opportunity that is um, extraordinarily rare, and we knew it. Um, we knew, I, I began opening every management meeting with, are we prepared for success? Mm -hmm. What happens if this works? What happens if this works? So we were able to grow, and I, and I believe this is an accurate number, 3,000% over the, the upcoming years. And we were named on Inc.'s fastest growing private uh, companies three years in a row. We had a 96% in stock percentage, and we never had a quality problem during this time. So the answer to my own question is we were prepared. We were prepared for success. Right, phenomenal. And then in, was it 2002, you said you sold to, to Teen fully for, was it 300 million plus? There was 300 million and then there was a stay bonus of another uh, 30 million for the management team. So 300 million, just yeah. a little shade below that. I believe it was 296 right. uh, for the company. We had no option. I, I, I uh, Dean Foods had, had 
floundered there out of Chicago and sold to a company in Dallas called Suiza. So I sued in court to be released from the obligation to sell. Mm. And I got to the Supreme Court of Colorado and they said, we know your intent was not to sell to this company, but your lawyers didn't protect you against this. You're obligated to do so. So I went to the chairman of uh, Team Foods, Greg Engels at the time, and, um, and his attorney, Michelle Goolsby, and I said, look, you have every right in the world for this company. Um, legally, I have lost it, so we're going to negotiate out a price. But I can tell you that if I'm not permitted to run the company autonomously and maintain its integrity, you will get the company, but you will not get the management team. We will walk. And um, I said, you, I remember the meeting. I said, you have to understand we're all about being green. Um, he said, we're all about being green too. We, our green has dead presidents on it. What's yours got? And I, I told him, I explained the principles of right livelihood and the principle of environmentalism that we were after and the vegan lifestyle. And I said, why don't we couple your green with my green and take it to Wall Street? Well, this is the ultimate dream for me. I started off saying I wanted to change, to prove a higher order of capitalism. And now I'm being given a shot at a public company that was doing $10 billion a year to run a division autonomously if he agreed. And, um, and ultimately he sent me a note and said, I think it was like one sentence and it says, I agree, let's go. Wow. And then how did that change things? Well, we got a lot more manufacturing capacity, I can tell you that. Uh, we went uh, from 125 million when um, we sold the company, or approximately around that, uh, to 305 million um, by the time uh, I left the company in 2005. So, in a three year period, we went from one and a quarter to 305 with a target for that year of 365. And to the best of my knowledge, that was achieved on the momentum of what we had done. So we, we had, uh, we were on fire. Absolutely. We had penetrated 15 million homes on a weekly basis. That's incredible. I, I understand when, when the sale went down, you um, talked to your investors into doing some, uh, some support or some, some give back to some, some employees. Can you tell me a little bit about that? We're going to go all the way back to the root. <laughs> the principle behind right livelihood can be summed up in the phrase, and we used, I used to use this a lot, good for me, good for you, good for everything it touches. So it was obviously at the sale point, good for me. And it was good for the consumer and good for what was going on out in the marketplace. Um, but was it good for the employees who had been with us? We weren't sophisticated enough to have a heavy duty retirement program. So I went to all of the investors and I said, I want you to give up 5% of uh, everything that you've invested in this and give it back to the company. And then we would, con we contributed um, individually a little more than that. Wow. Uh, we went back to the employees and then awarded each employee I believe it was $27,000 per year that they worked for the company. Wow. And our, you know, our truck driver had been with us for 20 some years at that point. So we gave away um, in the teens uh, of millions to our employees. So good for me, good for you, good for everything it touches. It was, we had to, we didn't have to, we lived to what we said our principles of right livelihood were. Uh, we're very proud of that. What did your investors say or in terms of giving back uh, so much? Did you get a lot of pushback? None. Zero. Now, the only way we took money is if they bought into the right livelihood concept. Remember, I wasn't selling soy. I was selling right livelihood. 
So from day one, they knew what my principles were. And when I went back to them and explained what we were doing, we had a full embracement. Everybody gave away um, a significant amount of money. It's yeah, amazing. Absolutely. How did you, so once that sale went, uh, took place, obviously you stayed for a few more years. And I, I assume that was part of the, the package. You know, obviously you came into an enormous amount of wealth. How, how did that feel? How did, did that change you? Did you, did you buy a house, buy cars? Like what was your life like after that sale went through? Eliminated all debt. Mm -hmm. um, that was what I did. I, I didn't go out and buy um, expensive cars. Uh, I did build my farm. I had bought a farm. I had leveraged my stock to buy a small farm north of Boulder. And I went back and, um, and rebuilt the home. Um, and I decided to treat myself so I went to Asia and bought um, <laughs> antique Buddhas. And that was my reward mm -hmm. for, um, for all the wealth that I had um, earned and been given. So it has changed my life in terms of giving me opportunity, choices. Um, I'm very grateful for those choices. Um, I'm very proud of the way we made it. We retired seven people and we, um, we generated 21 millionaires out of wow. the business. So we have a lot to be proud of as a team. Absolutely. After it was sold, you're doing well, you could have just retired, but then you started Next Foods. So tell me more about that. Tell us why start another company. Let's, let's go back for a little bit to uh, Silk for just a second and say that I ran that, I ran the branded division for Dean Foods, which included Land of Lakes, Horizon Organic, and Silk. Why in the world would I do that? Mm -hmm. When those are contradictory to the principles of what I have been describing the entire time, I had become transformed, hypnotized by the ability of silk to climb a very, very rare ladder. And that is we were headed at the momentum we were going, we were headed towards a billion dollar brand and we knew it and I knew it. And I, uh, I did not want to let go of this opportunity because I was out to out profit the profiteers. I could prove that business with a virtue could make you more money. I mean, can you imagine Wall Street saying, if I just choose virtue, I can make more money? So I wanted to stay with running White Wave. I did for uh, two years. And then I, um, in contradiction to performance, which was very high, where growth rate was very good, our profits were uh, double digit millions, significant millions. Uh, I was told I was the wrong guy for the job. And um, and I was fired. So that sent me on a tailspin. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I um, ended up traveling to different parts of the world for a while just to get my bearings. Coming back, I realized that I wasn't finished proving right livelihood because too much of the story was Steve-centered. It was the, um, the CEO show as opposed to the right livelihood show. So uh, somebody came to me with a Pro proprietary uh, probiotic out of Sweden and said this has 14 human clinical trials behind it and I had convened a group of uh, doctors and scientists at my home and I had asked them um, what's the future of food and because I'm interested maybe in getting back into the industry 
and they said, solve the gut problem and you'll solve the health problem. Well, this probiotic was the right product. I had the drive for right livelihood, so I convened the management team, some of the managers from uh, my direct report team out of um, Boulder, out of White Wave, and I said, I'm interested in going into right livelihood. If you can buy back into the, the philosophy, uh, I'm ready to go. And thus was born Next Foods. Only it was born with the intent of me not being the chairman, me not being the CEO, mm -hmm. so that the principals themselves would, um, would prove themselves uh, without a personality. Right, fantastic. And so, what what's the status of Next Foods? It's uh, Good Belly is the is the juice that it produces. I understand. It produces a probiotic fruit juice. Um, I've been very removed from it. I'm a stockholder in the company, a significant stockholder in the company. I've been very removed from it. Um, it was it wasn't negative, but the relationship was not close with the management team that ultimately ran the company. And my advice was um, get out of fruit juice and get into kombucha hmm. because that's where the market is headed and it's headed away from sugar and there's too much sugar in fruit juice. And that fell on deaf ears. So um, I retired. I said I've kind of done with business. I came down to Costa Rica and opened a couple small businesses, but I I finished my my work. Right. Wow. Well, good for you for for sticking to your virtues <laughs> all throughout and and um, you know right to the right to the end. Like I, I I love the concept of right livelihood. Is it is it similar to? Would you say it's similar to like kind of a B corp? What they call B corp these days, benefit corporation, which I understand Silk is right now. Yes. To the best of my knowledge, because you know more about B Corps than I do, um, social responsibility is not something that you add on to a business. It's an inherent aspect of the business if it's being true to uh, moral values. So if it's good for me, good for you, and everything it touches, it has to give back to the society. It has to be environmentally sound. It has to treat its, re its employees, its customers, its distributors with respect. Um, I, again, I don't know what the definition of um, a B Corp truly is, but my understanding is that um, the totality of this value system has been embraced. It's, not, it's no longer just social consciousness. It's actually... Um, intrinsic in the business model. Right. What would you say to those entrepreneurs, especially plant-based entrepreneurs slash vegan entrepreneurs that feel guilty about making a profit, especially when, you know, they're trying to save the world and they feel like you shouldn't put a dollar amount to improving people's health or creating a more sustainable planet or being more compassionate to animals. You know, how do you rectify that or bring back together reconcile your wanting to save the world at the same time also create, create a sustainable not just a sustainable but a successful uh business ronnie i'm shameless <laughs> i'm shameless in the fact that wealth is a consequence it's not a goal and it just so happened that we became extraordinarily large now, each carton of silk had a value and a price assigned to it. So the extraction was minimal. It wasn't like we were gouging and that it was obscenely expensive. It was priced competitively against any other good sound business model. We just hit a scale that was unseen. I believe that we were the first and largest company ever to penetrate mainstream market out of the natural foods industry or organic foods industry. And I have no guilt whatsoever, none about accumulating wealth. The question is, um, once you have wealth, what do you do with it? 
uh, are you still contributing to the benefit of humanity? Are you still positive? But I don't see anything wrong with making a reasonable, fair profit for your efforts. If you're an artist and crafts person, you make something proportionate to the size of your business. You want to stay small. If you're an industrialist and you've chosen your product wisely and you've followed this value system out fanatically, what's wrong with getting wealthy? I mean, I'm shameless at it. I, I, I have no um, qualms about it whatsoever. I encourage people to go out and do their best, period. Fantastic. Are there any brands, plant-based brands out there today that you admire or, or over the years that you've admired or even um, tried to try to roll, roll model yourself after? I do have a favorite. Um, it's traditional medicinals. Hmm. Um, it, it's the uh, herb tea company out of Northern California run by a name, by, uh, by a guy by the name of Drake Sadler. Um, Traditionals is a right livelihood business. It um, it not only promotes its product, which is wholesome and healthy and beneficial to humans and everything, he's environmentally sensitive, as well as he stimulates the, um, the culture, the economy of where he gets his supplies from. So it's a virtuous circle. And uh, that is a great model to me that he's been able to sustain it for as well. I think he started in 1974 mm -hmm. and has been true to his, true to his values uh, ever since. Fantastic. I've just got one last question for you. Ronnie might have a follow-up, but you talk about, you know, be, par be prepared for success. How would you define success? Success is effectively rising to the occasion of delivering your product and your service in a wholesome way to as many people as you possibly can without negatively affecting anybody in the value chain. Hmm. That to me is success. Everything else is a consequence. Wow. Powerful. That's, That's what we chased. I mean, we were making the most hated food in the United States. You really think we were thought we were going to make money? <laughs> I mean, come on. That was, that's a joke. Um, right. So what happened to us was, I think we touched a vein of harmony that I encourage others to um, put within their sights and try and achieve as well. If nothing else, you end up with bragging rights at what I call bragging rights at the dinner table, where you can sit and be proud of what you've done, making your living to supply your family with the needs that it has. Does it make you rich? I don't know. I don't know what anybody's karma is going to be or the size of their business or anything else, but it will give you great fulfillment in the realm of livelihood, right? Livelihood. That's what it was all about. That's still all it's about. That's why I'm sitting here talking with you. <laughs> I'm a broken record. Mm. As you know, there's a lot going on in the world where a lot of entrepreneurs are definitely more passionate about saving the world, as I mentioned earlier, about whether it's for people's health or for uh, the planet, right, sustainability, worried about how we're impacting the planet and as well as compassion for animals. It's a growing movement. What do you see as the future moving forward? Given your visionary approach to things, where do you see the next big space that entrepreneurs should really pay close attention to? Well, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to be narrow in my definition just because of my own self-interest in terms of the food world, um, I, I would probably be able to expand this into just about anything, but um, we're, uh, to put it mildly, we're a densely populated planet. We have stressed our resources. We have stressed ourselves. Uh, we need to climb down the ladder of complexity 
in the food world. Um, we've recently seen this um, prior to COVID, we've seen this rise in uh, plant-based foods, primarily because of environmental considerations and also animal rights considerations. Now, with COVID coming along, the meat supply system has been radically challenged and it's going to give people pause to look at their lifestyle choices. We've seen the environment clear up. Uh, we've seen pictures of various cities and scenery where they haven't seen it that clear in their lifetime. Um, these are, these are life altering experiences that I don't think everyone will forget. Will we go back to a normal? Will it change overnight? I'm not that naive. But I do believe that there is a movement afoot uh, along the lines of what you're talking about, that there will be a continuing uh, increase, rising tide of social responsibility, uh, vegan uh, lifestyle, environmentalism. I think people are going to reassess their value system and line up with those companies that are bringing benefits to humans and to the planet. Um, that's where capitalism is headed. By default, it will become right livelihood. Mm -hmm. I agree. Wow, fantastic. Yeah, I agree. And I look forward to seeing it <laughs> and being a part of so it. So do I. Yeah, yeah, so do I in this lifetime. Well, I, I just want to thank you so much for, for sharing your story with us. Uh, we really appreciate it. It's fantastic. It's inspiring to me for sure as an, as an entrepreneur in the plant-based space, as a, as a global citizen, as a, as a person who's got silk milk in my fridge right now. <laughs> thank you very much. It's the oat variety, which thank has come you. along in the last few years, but, but we have it and my kids love it. And, uh, Good. Yeah. I'm glad. It's, Plant-based uh, it's been... beverages have a have a, uh, a distinct impact and I'm very proud mm -hmm. of the fact of being involved early in the game with it. I am deeply appreciative for to both of you for giving me the opportunity to speak about my deepest passion. Thank you. Thank yeah, you. You're a, Thank you're, you for you're everything you've done. You're a true pioneer done. in the field and um, yeah, I look forward to, to being in touch and, and if there's other plant-based entrepreneurs out there that, that want to get in touch with you, is, is there a best way to, to reach you? steve.demus at gmail. Okay, there you go. I appreciate your time and uh, I look forward to keeping in touch and, and hearing, uh, hearing how your retirement's enjoying in, in Boulder and, and down in Costa Rica. So stay safe down there and uh, hopefully you'll get back uh, this way sometime soon. Sean, Ronnie, thank you very much for the opportunity. It's been a real pleasure speaking with you today. Wow, that was fantastic. Really enjoyed that chat with Steve. What did you think, Ronnie? Very inspirational. The whole right livelihood mantra approach is exactly what i believe in it's just that i didn't know there was a term for it other than saying the socially uh or the social b corporation and to be socially conscious right a social conscious entrepreneur or a social entrepreneur having that same approach or philosophy in life now i have another turn to put it in and i'm just totally blown away at what he said what he was able to do and it's made me rethink a lot of the way I mentally think about my business in so many ways, just from the profit standpoint, but also from the help and save the world standpoint and how I reconcile the two. I'm going to be processing this for the next few days, just trying to <laughs> make sure that I'm aligned with my true value and my passion and my legacy. Yeah, absolutely. Like just, you know, the words that, that stick out to me are like just perseverance, trailblazing, uh, you know, 17 year overnight success story. You know, it's just that they're, 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 these overnight success stories don't happen. We all want them, but they, they just don't happen. And um, it was, uh, yeah, it was phenomenal. And, and what a pioneer, you know, they, they say that history repeats itself. And when he talks about like the early days of a tofu business and having so many companies out there wanting to save the world through tofu and, and other plant-based products, I can't believe he's saying this. And, you know, from the, in the seventies, like, it sounds like it is today. Like we feel like we're pioneering today in the plant-based movement, but it sounds exactly the same in the seventies. <laughs> Do you hit that 
right on the on the head because I thought the same thing as, as he was talking about the seventies, right in the start of Silk, and he was talking about them being connected, right, and being more concerned about the environment, about animals, about the planet, uh, and to me, those are all terms that we use now, right? Those are all reasons that we talk about our generation being more concerned when really, no, the, every generation has a concerned, a, an enlightened or awakened part of the population. And again, it just made me, it made me hopeful. If anything, his whole talk, I walked away hopeful for entrepreneurs and also for our ability to rise to the challenge and help the future. So I'm, I'm feeling jazzed. I'm really feeling inspired to do more. Absolutely. Absolutely. Fantastic show today. Really, really appreciate Steve coming on and taking the time and uh, we look forward to, to our next show. We'll, uh, we'll talk to you guys soon. Bye-bye.